Hello, I'm John Key, Prime Minister of New Zealand, and I'm watching Country 99 TV. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Glenis Christian for Country 99 TV. Welcome to the first of our exclusive three-part specials on trading among farmers, TAF. The final countdown is on. On June 25th, Fonterra farmers will cast their final votes on this crucial issue which will determine the future of their cooperative. So we're bringing you the people in the hot seat, both those who are staunch proponents of TAF and those fiercely opposed. We'll also hear from federated farmers, independent industry analysts, Fonterra shareholders and politicians. In our first programme, we hear from the architects of TAF, Fonterra Chairman Sir Henry van der Hayden, Fonterra Director and Chairman of its Capital Structure Committee, John Wilson, and the new Fonterra Shareholders Council Chairman, Ian Brown. My first question is to you, Henry. What is TAF going to deliver to Fonterra's 10,000 plus shareholders? TAF in its very simple form is all about removing redemption risk from the cooperative. And this is capital that washes in and out of our balance sheet at the end of every financial year. So that delivers us permanent capital so we can carry on driving a strategy to add value for our farmers. And secondly, it gives our farmers flexibility. Just in its very simple form, we're going to three years in and three years out. Um, it allows some of our farmers some flexibility as they're growing their businesses. And it's also helping young people into the industry. Why has the path to get to this point been so rocky? What I talk about, look, when you start talking about the key things in the cooperative around ownership and control, that really does stimulate um, the debate. And I think that's healthy. I call it the cooperative way. Mm. So it doesn't worry you that there has been such a, an amount of dissent along the way and that farmers, even at the 11th hour, are still quite opposed to TAF and some of its structure and detail, despite the strengthening moves that have been made? Yeah, it sort of reminds me of the time when he formed Fonterra in 2001. It was exactly the same. But at the end of the day, you get the information out there, farmers got the information, they will make the right decision here. John, you're the chairman of the uh, Capital Structure yep. Committee for um, Fonterra. Uh, can redemption risk really be solved by bringing in TAF? Some people say redemption risk is a problem you just can't sort out. Oh, no, absolutely. By bringing in TAF, we solve redemption risk. And it's critical that we focus on that as the reason for doing trading amongst farmers. And trading amongst farmers, in my word, is actually all about time. It's time for our farmers to make decisions, far more flexibility for our farmers in running their own businesses, and it gives Fonterra a whole lot more flexibility going forward. And as Henry just touched on, it's critical we get that to be able to drive forward our strategy. It's all about permanent capital. It solves redemption risk. Now, Ian, out there amongst farmers, are there other suggestions of any ways that uh, this amount of capital could stop washing in and out of Fonterra? Other uh, alternatives to TAF, uh, have they been put up and discussed and rejected? Yeah, there has been there has been other um, scenarios put up, but the current the TAF model is the preferred option. It it does it does solve redemption risk, which is the obligation of Fonterra to redeem, and none of the others actually do that to the extent that TAF does. So you know, TAF to the council and to farmers is is the preferred option. Let's hear from a farmer now. If we had a natural disaster in New Zealand, God help us, something like foot and mouth, and we had a mass exodus of, um, of shareholders because the, the production dropped 30 or 40 per cent, and Fonterra had to pay out those shareholders for their shares. And from what I believe, the fundamentals of a cooperative is to protect the shareholders, and TAF will protect the shareholders that are there, and, and I think that is the most important thing. Ian, what do you make of that? Yeah, that's exactly right. It, uh, TAF protects the, the loyal shareholders that stay with the cooperative, and it also protects the core assets of Fonterra, should, should such uh, an event like that occur. If TAF is such a no-brainer, why was the Fonterra Shareholders Council unable to reach a unanimous position on it? OK, so just to quickly explain, the, the Shareholders Council is a representative body, 35 regionally elected farmers, um, diverse in thought, diverse in age, diverse in scale. You know, it, it is exactly right that we don't get a, a unanimous in most situations, and the reason for that is that we will have a representation of the farmer base, which is an extreme at one end and the other. So it's, it is quite normal, it's nothing to be concerned about, and in fact it's a real strength, because 
we get within the council chambers, we get the debate, we understand their issues, and we can ensure that those very issues that that, that percentage of our of our councillors bring up are abs absolutely realised and further strengthen the structure going forward and, and create unity amongst farmers. So how many councillors did actually vote against TAF? Uh, well, we had 93% vote for TAF, so 7% against, um, you know, five or six councillors. Henry, as uh, chairman, does it make a difference to you to have uh, the council uh, that has uh, a minority that uh, are against proposals that the... Fonterra board is so strongly behind. Oh, I think you know if, if you look at it, we've got um, a united and a unanimous board supporting this. We've got wide, wide majority, overwhelming a majority of the shareholders um, council. And over the meetings over the last um, couple of weeks, it's been fantastic having the board and council standing side by side. You've had directors and councillors saying this is the right thing for um, the cooperative, and really encouraging farmers to get in behind the cooperative, unify the cooperative, and vote yes for trading amongst farmers. Right. John, did you hope that you might? get to a position where you could persuade all of the Fonterra shareholders councillors that uh, TAF was the way to go? Think, or was that just too difficult to I achieve? Think, I think Ian's just hit, it, hit the nail firmly on the head, Glennis. The reality is that it is a cross-section of our farmer base, the council, and it's the strength of our governance representation model in Fonterra. It lets us evolve our cooperative going forward after much discussion and debate. I, many years ago, actually chaired the council. I never had a unanimous council either when I was chairing it, and uh, that's the reality. And I don't, I don't know, but I suspect you'll never have a unanimous council because that's the reality of, of our cooperative and the different points of view we have in our cooperative. Ian, how much difference did it make, uh, the recent uh, change in proposals that strengthened uh, TAF to quite an extent? Uh, did that win over quite a lot more councillors and get them right in behind... Uh, what happened? Yeah, uh, uh, to, to win over is probably not quite right. I think the council followed a two-year independent process. You know, in, in a conjunction with the board, we had our own independent due diligence process going on, and during that process, we identified areas that you know we thought could further strengthen the TAF model, mm -hmm. and you know those 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 proposals were accepted by the board at the end of the day. But I think what was really important was for the council that we saw a construct or a TAF that actually works and works well into the future. And that was, um, that was important. We think we've done that, uh, you know, when we've really concentrated on areas that define the purpose of trading amongst farmers. Um, we've shored up the milk price with some more independence, you know, and the constitutional limits are appropriate for what TAF has set out to do. And the control mechanisms that the Council has around uh, monitoring those, the fund limits in particular, are vital for us and, and we are comfortable that we can achieve our objectives here. What about uncertainties that remain after the sudden resignation of the former chairman, Simon Cooper? Uh, how hard do you believe you need to uh, uh, work, perhaps, to uh, step into that role at such a crucial time? Yes, there's always uncertainty, but, you know, that's the nature of the business. And, look, uh, you just step up and get on with it. And, you know, you take heart that the majority of council are behind TAF, you know, a clear majority, north of 90%. So, you know, that... that, that you know, to go back to the old saying, you know, that, that's what the cooperative's about. Mm. It's strength in numbers and we've got clear direction and we'll move forward. Mm. Just, just maybe, mm. just helping out a little bit there. I don't know if you still remember, Glennis, but when we formed Fonterra in 2001, I actually had two directors actually resign from the Dairy Group Board mm. um, at, at that time. You know, so when these big decisions are made, you know, directors or councillors, they make decisions what they think is actually right. But at the end of the day, farmers look past that. Farmers will always vote what they think is the best for their cooperative. What about uh, the continued speculation that uh, Simon Cooper perhaps saw some detail, there was something there that uh, other farmers weren't privy to uh, that scared him off the TAF proposal? OK, well, I can't speak um, for Simon, but everyone's saying, just like what you've said, is Simon seeing something? But look, all the information is out there. Now, the question that I ask, Glenn, is what's the information that he's seen that no-one else has actually seen? So I don't think that's um, the case at all. You know, everyone makes their own decisions and we need to respect that. Thanks, Henry. Coming up after the break, we find out what happens if the watershed vote goes against TAF and we hear from more farmers. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Glenis Christian. We're back talking about TAF with guests, Fonterra Director John Wilson, Shareholders Council Chairman Ian Brown and Fonterra Chairman Henry van der Hayden. Henry, what say TAF has voted out 
or voted in by a very narrow majority. Where does that leave Fonterra? OK, what I've been saying, Glenn, is we had a round of farmer meetings. You know, what we're looking to do here is actually unify um, the cooperative. So this vote... Um, next Monday is a lot more than just voting on TAF. It's actually bringing the cooperative um, together and all stakeholders of the cooperative. So if we just get north of a 50% um, vote, I don't think the board's in a position to push the button on um, trading amongst farmers. Would 60% be enough? Uh, what we're actually saying, we want a very clear uh, mandate. I think it's just too early to say what um, the number is because what farmers are voting on is actually four um, resolutions. Um, so the first resolution is asking farmers um, to support trading amongst farmers. Then the second resolution, which is a special resolution, uh, which requires constitutional change, that's a 75% um, percent, um, support that, that we require there. And, and resolutions three and four are shareholder resolutions, which are ordinary resolutions. So it just depends where all that actually plays out. So we can't put a number on it, but we're saying we want a very clear mandate from our farmers to unify the cooperative. Right. You're retiring as uh, chairman in November. What about uh, your continued place on the board, depending on the TAF vote? Have you made any decisions there? No, I haven't made any decisions um, there yet. But the question does get asked, um, Glenis, um, is TAF going to be your legacy? Now, for me, you know, I think the formation of Fonterra, and I'd like to think you know, 20 years of commitment um, to the cooperative, that's what my legacy um, is going to be. But let's just come to the key question, if TAF doesn't actually happen. What that there actually means is the redemption risk is still with the cooperative and that means the future successor of Fonterra still has to actually deal with this fundamental issue. So capital structure is back on the agenda again. And let's not forget, over the last week or so, uh, many people that have put a lot of time and effort into this industry, Murray Goff, Sir Dryden Spring, have come out and said this is the right thing, it actually strengthens the cooperative. And also I see that um, Professor Michael Cook, um, an absolute expert on cooperatives, also saying this actually strengthens the cooperative. So when you've got people like that saying this is the right thing for Fonterra, I think that's actually powerful. And it's one of the ironies of this whole discussion where some of the concern is around ownership and control. And we've got a unanimous board, uh, very strong support out of the Shareholders' Council because what TAF does is it strengthens ownership and control and we don't have that right now. And so it's that just to very, very much support what Henry was saying, this is about all of us moving forward with the United Cooperative, so it's critical. The issues are the fundamental issues. So, you know, we've had both sides of the debate here. One is 100% control and ownership and also the integrity of the farm gate milk price. They're exactly the right issues that we should be debating here. Yeah. Now from the board's um, perspective, we think both those two things we've actually cemented in much stronger than what, what it is today. And that's why we say that trading amongst farmers, TAF, actually strengthens the cooperative. With the strengthening of some of the safeguards around TAF, some farmers are still not convinced. Let's go to one of our farmers in the field now. My question is how farmers are going to maintain control in the TAF situation agreement. Good question. What do you say to them, Ian? Yeah, look, that's a key question, Glenis. I think control uh, within the cooperative is, you know, milk and capital are still linked, and that, that's the fundamental linkage in a cooperative, so, so that doesn't change. The other aspect of control within the cooperative is, is the voting, and the voting for the shareholders, the voting for your governors of the business. That still remains with milk solids as well. So that's in farmers' hands. To me, that... that that shores up ownership and control. With the views of farmers such as that still being out there, was it an option for the council to look at, uh, to call for the whole legislation and the vote to be delayed until, be, until more farmers could be convinced that this was the right way to go? No, I don't think that there's a need to delay it anymore. I mean, as I said earlier, we've been going for two years on this now as a council, and, and, it's, and farmers have been, you know, June 2010 was the last time they voted for TAF, so it, it's been out there and it's, it's been on the agenda and although it has been, you know, time, uh, as Henry has said, has worked against us on this one. Mm. Yes, yes, there are fears, but as a council, we believe the work's been done. Mm. Um, you know, this is a very, very strong and robust model now. Yes, legislation isn't through the House yet, but it's tracking, so that, that's fine and we are subject to the legislation. But, you know, 90% of it's there, so I think it's appropriate that we... We keep moving. Yeah, may, maybe, you know, when you say, should we actually slow down? We've de been debating this capital structure for mm -hmm. over five years now. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been engaging with government for more than um, two years. And, and I think time has played against us here, Glenis. But let's not um, forget around legislation. You know, the government had to deal with the Christchurch earthquake, rightfully so. And we also had four milk inquiries over the last um, 12 months. And the integrity of the farm... Farmgate milk price is um, fundamental, so time has played against us. But I, I think we've actually used time to our advantage also. I think we've got a much, much stronger model um, that we're asking our farmers to vote on next week.
John, getting down to some of the nitty-gritty of a TAF proposal, one of the um, sticking points with a lot of farmers seems to be why do we need outside investors? Why can't farmers just trade shares amongst themselves? We need outside investors to get that liquidity. And I think, again, it's just covering off that government uh, question you asked. Mm. The reality is in New Zealand, we've had to come up with a unique situation uh, to solve a unique situation here. So we've had a formula which is trading amongst farmers. And one of the questions that's asked is why are we bringing investors into the cooperative? Glennis, we are not bringing investors into the cooperative. This fund is sitting alongside our cooperative. There's a firewall between our cooperative and where the fund is sitting. There's a legal firewall and there's also an economic firewall. So we have got no concerns about investors having undue influence, any meaningful influence at all actually, over Fonterra, our cooperative. So that fund is there to provide liquidity so we can have open entry and exit, which is a unique challenge that we have because of our very success within the New Zealand environment. Yeah, I'd just like to carry on on some of the things that John's actually saying here. And John is right, there is some misunderstanding out there around investors coming into the cooperative. We've got to make it crystal clear that um, it's not investors within the, within the cooperative. It's only farming farmer shareholders that can own shares in the cooperative and the unit fund is separate uh, from the cooperative. And one of the other funny things around this, people are saying, or some farmers are saying, Henry, this is about the cooperative raising capital. This is not about the, the cooperative raising capital. This is about permanent capital. Now for those farmers that want to sell their economic rights, they receive the cash um, for selling those economic rights through the custodian um, to the unit fund. So Fonterra doesn't receive the capital, the farmers do. So this is the point that I made when you asked me, what is TAF going to deliver? It actually helps with flexibility for many of our growing farmers, and that's a positive around trading amongst farmers. So John, who are the outside investors likely to be? Well, I think most importantly, many of them will be our farmers. So it's, I think, I probably haven't done a meeting in five or six years where farmers don't come up to me afterwards, older farmers, saying, John, at what point can we stay as investors in our cooperative? Now, they're not going to be able to be investors in our cooperative, as we've just touched on, but they're going to be able to stay involved in the wider Fonterra family by being unit holders. So when they sell their farms, those retiring farmers that wish to are going to become unit holders, and we know that because there's a lot of interest. Younger farmers entering Fonterra in the future have a view that in the future they're going to be supplying shareholders. They can purchase units in advance at a later date, turn those into shares. Uh, ma and par investors off the street in New Zealand and of course also institutions. And it's important to say institutions are not a dirty word. We actually want institutions in there because they will provide a lot of the liquidity. I've heard it said with the strengthening of the TAF proposals, uh, there's not so much in it now for investors. They've got all these constraints on them that they didn't have under the previous proposal. Do you think it's going to scare quite a lot of them off and uh, there may not be that much money or that much interest from these investors? Yeah, Glenis, I, I think it, it may scare some off, but I, I think the reality is that people will be investing with their eyes wide open. So they'll accept those conditions when they invest and, and they'll price it appropriately. So, so you know, I, I think it's the right way to go. And much as we have a cooperative share now that, that has a restricted market value discount, for example, you know, that will be a natural discount given the lack of controls that a, a unit investor may have. Coming up after the break, we hear what the new version of the world's largest dairy exporter will look like if TAF wins the day. Stay tuned. Welcome back to our exclusive TAF special. I'm Glenis Christian. With me, my special guests, Fonterra Chairman Henry van der Hayden, Fonterra Director John Wilson, and Ian Brown, Chairman of the Fonterra Shareholders Council. Now, Henry, there have been a lot of examples overseas of cooperatives who've gone down similar paths to uh, TAF un under different guises. It's ended up not being what farmers in the end have decided they wanted. What assurances can you give farmers that TAF is not going to fall into that uh, level of things? OK, firstly, we've looked at all the examples um, offshore. And, you know, we've been talking about capital structure now for four or five um, years. Now, Fonterra is um, unique. Now, many of the examples overseas, they actually allowed external capital or investors into the cooperative. Now, we are not allowing external investors into the cooperative. They are alongside um, the cooperative where they only invest in the unit fund, but not in the cooperative. Now, and that's all because that we want to maintain 100% farmer ownership and control. So we've looked at all the models. Um, and we think this is exactly the right model for Fonterra. 
John, what about the role of the custodian, if I can just ask you? That's pretty central to what Henry's talking about uh, by way of the investors sitting outside the cooperative. Oh, absolutely. Mm. And that's why we went out and spoke to our farmers about this earlier on this year. And we have put in place, again, a unique solution for Fonterra and for this environment that we operate in. And it's been about the Fonterra farmer custodian. So it is owned by our Fonterra farmers. It can only be changed, the custodian trustee, with 75% of our farmers' shareholders voting to change it. And it very much locks down uh, where that share title sits. It provides the flexibility to enable trading amongst farmers to actually work. It is exactly the right solution. Just around the custodian, it is actually part of the cooperative, and we've just got to reinforce there is a firewall, a defined line between the cooperative and the unit fund. Right. With the uh, changes uh, to TAF that have uh, just been made strengthening, Ian, the uh, council takes on a rather more powerful role in the future if there is any change to be made to some of these provisions. Uh, how do you see that playing out in the future? Look, I see that as a real positive, and I just want to jump back to your question to Henry around the cooperatives that we studied, uh, you know, that, that were less than successful with the change in capital structure, and one of the take-home messages from that was the governance within those cooperatives. So I just really do see the, for, the future with the council and, and the board of directors that Fonterra has in terms of its governance structure as a real strength. So to your question on that, then, yes, will our role change? The answer is that the majority of our role will stay the same in terms of the Council monitors the performance of Fonterra v via the Fonterra board. So we look at the performance measures there, we look at the protections, we look at the risks in that regard. We also monitor the governance of Fonterra, and subsequent to successful, a TAF being successfully implemented, it's the protection for farmer shareholders is around the fund risk management policy. So that will be a new... Uh, performance role, or a monitoring role, I should say, for the council. And yes, it will strengthen up the council in terms of what its, uh, what its intended function is in terms of protecting farmers. But equally so, it should now, it should actually tie shareholders in with their councillors, which is their representative body, because they need to understand the sorts of people they put on council and the function that council needs to perform in the future. So, look, I, I see it as a strengthening. I see it as, as unifying shareholders. And I see it as actually really strengthening the model in terms of connecting shareholders via the council, via the board, to Fonterra's strategy, which is absolutely key for all of our futures. And Glenis, I, there's two yep. things that are fundamental for me as a farmer, let alone myself as a director. That is, farmers vote with their milk solids, with their shed up milk solids. Today, it must always be the case for the future. And the other is the strength of our governance and representation model. That will allow us to continue to evolve and meet our challenges globally. And we have to continue, continue to evolve. And that's the, that's the council and the board and their respective roles. It's critical for us. Thanks, John. Let's hear from our final farmer. Yeah, I think for the reason of having permanent capital, uh, permanent capital on the, on the balance sheet, I, th I think it does have to happen. But on the other hand, do we do we really need these outside investors um, putting their money and fingers into our pie, really? Now that's one for you, Henry. Yeah, look, I just got to make it clear: it's um, the outside investors are separate and not part of the cooperative. Um, so that is so important and that's how we can maintain the 100% control and ownership. So um, the outside investors are not part of the cooperative. We had a fund um, alongside Fonterra many years ago and it was called Dairy Equities. It wasn't Fonterra's but it was sitting there. If Fonterra does not move forward, even for a bit, if Fonterra does not move forward with trading amongst farmers, we know with certainty that some of our farmers are actually looking to have something like a fund sitting out there. What we've done here is use that concept to enable us to get that liquidity to enable trading amongst farmers to function and put all of our rules around it, like the custodian you just talked about before. What about retentions, Henry? This is an issue that uh, farmers feel very strongly about. Uh, investors might be looking for uh, rather a different uh, approach from Fonterra to uh, holding money back. Well, let's not forget, the majority of the board will always be farmer elected our directors, so we will drive the cooperative in the interest of the farmers. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what we've got today is the cooperative, we get capital from two mechanisms. One is growth in milk supply. Under TAF, that'll be exactly the same. We've got a retention policy where the board will retain um, somewhere between 25 and 35% of our operating earnings, and we expect that to carry on um, if we implement uh, and execute trading amongst farmers. OK, so we're moving on to uh, summarising the positions, I guess. Um, John, if TAF wins on the day, 
what will it mean for the future of Fonterra? Oh, we can execute our strategy. We can get on, we can move more rapidly. I think really importantly it's for our whole cooperative though. Our farmers have more flex flexibility, more simplicity to get on and run their own businesses with more options. And Fonterra, for our farmers, um, we can, as a board, we can support our management in executing our strategy. And that is very, very exciting for us going forward. And uh, Ian, what about the complexity of some of the information that farmers have had to deal with at a very short notice uh, in order to make their vote by the 25th? Is that a concern for you? Uh, I, complexity, I think there is complexity in the detail. I think at a, at a, at a higher level, it, it is exactly the same as we were talking about two years ago, given a slight change in the custodian, the structure of the custodian. Mm -hmm. So I, I, nothing's effectively changed, you know, and the complexity is the multiple layers of protection around the fund and Fonterra itself. It's that firewall we talk about, and that's where an awful lot of legal protections has gone in. And I don't know that farmers, you know, farmers can be assured that, you know, with a, with a majority of, um, a, a significant majority of council supporting TAF and a unanimous board, you know, our total focus has been on protecting ownership and control in that regard. So farmers, I think, can be relaxed or comfortable there that it has been looked at with their interests at the forefront. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the overall um, trading amongst farmers, you know, to John's comment around allowing Fonterra to execute the strategy, you know, with TAF in place, it does that and protects farmers' ownership and control and gives farmer flexibility in their personal on-farm situations in terms of their shareholding. Can right. I just put some perspective around the detail? Yes, there has been a lot of detail in trading amongst farmers, and sometimes there is questions of detail asked. It's been critical for us as a board, as Henry touched on, to move forward together, unify our cooperative with this vote. And we have supplied all that detail to our farmers, because I can tell you in the last two years, capital structure work, due diligence, reporting to the shareholders council and the level of high quality questions you get out of the council. And I must say, every question on trading amongst farmers is a good question. But after being through all of that detail, we have got absolute comfort around these key aspects. Ownership and control, always for our farmers, and the integrity of the milk price. But it's important that our farmers saw that detail. Thanks, John. Very and simply, trading amongst farmers, Glenn, is, is all about giving our farmers flexibility, particularly our growing farmers. It stops capital from washing in and out of the balance sheet of Fonterra, so we get permanent capital. And what's all that about? It puts more money in farmers' pockets, and that's what Fonterra, the cooperative, is all about. So, in a nutshell, why should farmers be voting for TAF? Because it's the right, it's the right thing to do for them, it's the right thing for the cooperative, and I think it sets us up for the next 10 years. There you go. The case for TAF from the men at the very top of New Zealand's largest company. The decision, whichever way it goes, will affect the economic fate of all New Zealanders. Thanks to my guests, Fonterra Chairman Sir Henry van der Hayden, Fonterra Director John Wilson, and Shareholders Council Chairman Ian Brown. And thanks to you at home for watching. For more information on TAF, check out your latest dairy exporter or head to the website www.dairyexporter.co.nz. And remember to tune in tomorrow for part two of our exclusive three-part series on TAF. You'll hear from three farmers fiercely opposed to TAF. They'll tell you why. You don't want to miss it. I'm Glenis Christian. See you soon. Stephen Joyce, the Minister of Economic Development, the Minister of Science and Innovation and the Minister of Tertiary Education, Skills and Employment. I'm here at Field Days talking to the Country 99 TV team, they're doing a great job uh, and I hope you're enjoying uh, their coverage.